This is the British Army's Chieftain main battle tank. The tank that saw service with the British Army from the late 1960s right the way through well into the 1990s. It took over from the Centurion, which was a tremendously successful design. Centurion went into service just at the end of the Second World War and um, was upgunned and up-armoured. So a very successful tank, the Centurion. Even though it was considered a great success, they worried about the tanks it might have to fight against, including tanks like the JS-3 and the T-10, the bigger, heavier Russian tanks that went into service just after the Second World War. So in Britain, they decided to put an even heavier gun on a tank and they built a super heavy tank called the Conqueror. And that was supposed to complement the Centurion. It was supposed to be in what would nowadays we call an overwatch position. Um, they take on the bigger Russian tanks, whilst hopefully the Centurions would be perfectly able to deal with tanks like the T-54 and the T-55. Now, what they realized, as soon as they were putting the Centurion into service, they knew they had to start the process of building its replacement. So they looked at the idea of the 120 millimeter gun that had been placed on the Conqueror. Let's combine that firepower with the mobility and the tactical handling of the Centurion. If we can put those two things together, we'll have that ideal tank. And that's the part of the thinking that goes behind Chieftain. Chieftain also, it's worth looking at because it's a, an obvious indicator of what British tank designers had picked up from the Second World War. And when they put the specification together in the war office, they were adamant it was going to have firepower first. That was the British great lesson. We had to have a tank with superior firepower than the enemies. Then it was going to be armour protection. We wanted our crews, we wanted survivability for the crews in there. We spent a lot of time and energy on training a tank crew. We want those guys to survive an engagement. And only thirdly came mobility. Now other countries after the war looked in very different directions. Germany famously with a Leopard tank, they ended up going for mobility first, firepower, and then armour protection. So the thinking behind that Second World War experience led to this huge, great big 120 millimeter gun. And this whole tank, don't forget, like most tanks, is really built around that firepower. It's for that gun to accurately get around onto the target. And again, for NATO countries, certainly in Britain and America, we were looking at the fact we were gonna to have to rely on our technological advantage in this generation of tanks, rather than sheer numbers. So the gun, 120 millimeter, for the first time, it's using what we would now probably call two-part ammunition. Technically, it was three-part ammunition. The round is loaded first as a separate component to what comes behind, which is a bag charge, a whopping great big bag of explosives. The third part of the ammunition is actually a cartridge, which ignites that bag charge to fly the round out at uh, supersonic speed out the end of the barrel. It's a rifled barrel gun, it tended to fire two main types of ammunition. Hesh, that's high explosive squash head, that has an armor penetrating capability. It pancakes on the side of an armored vehicle, detonates a second after a pancaking and creates a shock wave that goes through the armor and that causes a scab to fly off on the inside of enemy armor. It also, Hesh works very well just as high explosive, so it's very good for firing at uh, targets in the open artillery positions, buildings. Second type of ammunition was armor piercing, discarding sabo. So basically a pot with a tungsten slug in the middle and that pot would fly away when it's left the end of the barrel, leaving that tungsten slug going at supersonic speed towards the enemy's tank. Now later in the development, when the British government got worried about the developing Russian tanks, T-72, T-64. They decided to develop a new type of round, and that was the um, discarding Sabot fin stabilized round, which is basically a long metal dart with little fins on the end to keep it straight. That was made of tungsten or later depleted uranium. And just by, again, its sheer kinetic energy, this massive long dart would burrow its way through the enemy armor quite often through and out the other side. So tremendously powerful gun and very accurate. To keep the gun accurate, they did a system called the muzzle reference system, which on the end of the barrel, there's a cap, uh, a rubber cap. Under that cap is a very small polished mirror. 
and a light is shone from just above the barrel into that mirror, it's bounced back and a red dot appears on the gunner's sight. And that means he can check if the barrel gets any droop on it or any bend because of a cold wind blowing on the side. And again, that helped with accuracy. Early versions of the tank were sighting their guns using a 50 caliber ranging gun. So basically they'd fire a few rounds, watch the tracer, which burnt out at about 2000 meters, see that hopefully hit the target, and then they knew they were on target. Um, you could fire that gun out to further distances because you, they put an explosive tip on the bullet. So if it hit the target, you would see that explosive tip make an indication. And then you, again, you knew you were on target. But in the early 70s, that was replaced by a Bar and Stroud rangefinder, which was a laser rangefinder, and that could accurately measure distances out to about 6,000 meters. And again, when you've got those sort of combinations, you've got a tremendously accurate gun. Fully stabilized, which means they could lock onto a target, and it didn't matter where the hull was going, the gun remains locked onto a target. And a well-trained crew inside this vehicle um, were getting ridiculously high first round hit rates, up to about 98%, out to about one and a half kilometers. That's tremendously accurate compared to really the Second World War generation of tanks, where quite often it was one round over, one round under, and then hopefully you'd be about on target with the third round. Now for armor protection, uh, a very heavily sloped steel frontage, um, you ended up with about 15 inches equivalent of metal protection on the front here with that angle they managed to put. And when the first models came out, they actually hid that frontage with a metal bin so people couldn't work out exactly the angle it was at. Um, that was part of the secrecy procedure. They also put round the mantlet, because there is no mantlet, the needle uh, arrangement at the front of the tank holding the gun, they put a canvas around that as well, again, to hide what it actually looks like in the very first model. So again, there was that sense of secrecy surrounding this vehicle because it was developing things in new areas. So armor protection, when the T-64 came out with its 115 millimeter gun, they're looking to up armor this tank and they put together a package by a, a Colonel Still and a, a, a chap who was working at Meavy at the time, Brewer, and they put this package together. They call it Still Brew Armor, and it adds extra armor to the front plates and to the front of the vehicle. So up armor during its, um, its service life. Marks one to five are really the production marks. And after that, in British Army service, it goes way up to mark 11. Um, but those marks are really just improvements all the way through. Over a thousand improvements go on in the Chieftain during its service life. So very thick armor protection, very powerful gun. Then we have to come on to the famous L60 engine. This, if anything, was the thing that let Chieftain down. Um, in the 1950s, when they're developing the tank, they go to a couple of companies to look at what could we come up with to meet the latest NATO requirement for a multi-fuel engine. NATO in 55 came out and said, look, we need, um, we're worried about petrol and diesel supplies. We need an engine on most NATO vehicles that could use either fuel source. So Leyland gets the project to develop the L60 engine. Rover, who were the other people looking at the issues, dropped out. Um, Leyland's L60, it was a horizontally opposed double stroke engine. It, it had huge problems in its, not only its development, but when it went into service. And it was consistently being worked on to try and improve it. Problems such as liners that would leak, and so there would be massive clouds of white and blue smoke coming out the back of the engine decks and that would give your position away which is a real worry um, it didn't quite meet the bhp the horsepower that was expected of it by the end of its time in service it was almost getting there but um, famously that was the thing that caused chieftain crews the most trouble it had something called a tn12 gearbox at the rear which was very good horseman suspension these are bolted in paired wheels on the outside the advantage of that type of suspension is really that you're not taking up internal space so it's very good in the sense of keeping the internal space areas down and can be relatively quickly replaced so a unit can be unbolted and replaced rather than uh, the trouble of taking a torsion bar out which really does take time One of the other issues the crew had to face up to in this generation of tank is the possibility of nuclear or chemical warfare. So on the back of the turret, there was a large 
filtration box that would suck in the air and the inside could be over of the tank could be over pressurized so in other words air was sucked in cleaned scrubbed and uh, then anything that would leak would only leak from the inside out because that's where the pressure was so nothing would come in to affect the crew and again if you look inside a chieftain it's that generation still of tank where it's almost all the kit is on the walls of the vehicle and surrounding you armored uh, charge bins um, liquid uh, pro propellant protectors so in other words the bag charges were put in plastic containers surrounded by liquid and the idea there again it would suppress if there was a penetration hopefully you wouldn't end up getting a secondary fire as that explosive charge detonated um, again we've hung some of the equipment the CES equipment that a tank would take into action with it um, all the sort of bits and pieces, everything from barrel cleaning equipment to uh, inside the tank, the little boiling vessel that was very popular with the crews because it meant you could get a hot drink or some hot food very, very quickly um, if the tank stops. And some of that other equipment we tend to forget about all the time as well. Simple things like um, personal weapons, grenades, map reading equipment, all sorts of stuff. This is a generation where they had um, infrared equipment on the vehicle for sighting but they also had detecting equipment that could work out whether you were being lasered or an infrared camera was on you. So again, this might give you notification um, that you're about to be attacked. So again, a vehicle of this generation, the amount of equipment inside is quite staggering. So overall, a very heavy tank. It was aimed at about 45 tonnes. It ended up coming in just under 60. Um, slow. 19 miles an hour on the battlefield cross country, a fair bit more on the open road, but um, not certainly as mobile as some of the other generation tanks that are coming around at this sort of time. But in many ways, that wasn't its problem. The problem it was facing up to all the time was the idea that it had to fire this gun very accurately at what it thought to be, if the Cold War had gone hot, numerous targets. Um, of advancing Soviet tanks and in that undoubtedly this was a very successful tank that gunnery was superb on the vehicle now it had a four-man crew driver supine position almost laying on his back that helps keep the profile down you've got three guys in the turret you've got the standard loader gunner and commander sitting behind overall I would consider this historically a very successful design it never had to fire its gun in anger in British Army service so in essence it did its job sitting out there with those crews out in Germany keeping an eye on the borders all that period of the Cold War um, so in that sense it did very well it was sold on into the Middle East um, the Israelis helped with the development of this tank they were at one point it looked like they were going to buy it the British government at the end of the 60s decided it was siding with the Arabs more than the Israelis at the time decided it wasn't going to sell the Chieftain um, and that led General Tao of the Israeli Defence Forces to go on and build the Merkava tank um, that's in service but it was sold to a number of uh, Middle Eastern countries and it does see action in the 1980s in the Iran and Iraq war where again British engineers went out to look at how it had performed and that's one of the other reasons they were very keen on the upper armouring process that went on at the front of the turret. So uh, a successful tank in one ways, a good export success into the Middle East, um, but fortunately for many of the crews inside, it never actually had to fight. <laughs>